Well, good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you to worship this morning at First Baptist. So glad that you're here, whether you're joining us in person or online. We're just grateful to be together and be able to worship the Lord together today. Um, if you are a guest with us, so glad that you have come to join. Uh, in the pew rack in front of you is a little card that looks like this. If you're a guest, please fill that out. Uh, put it in the offering plate. That will let us know of your presence with us today. And also on the back of this card is a place to write prayer requests. And anyone can share a prayer request, and we'll be happy to pray for you uh, as a staff uh, and a, a church. And actually, you can share on there which, uh, how widely you would like that prayer request shared. Um, a number of our church family have been on mission in South Dakota, serving the Native Americans this week. Um, several of those are not back yet, but I've been hearing really good reports how that has gone. Uh, that involved construction, uh, men's and women's Bible studies, and also there was a memorial service for those who've been lost during COVID since we were able to last be there with those folks. So that's been a meaningful week. Uh, our pastor was a part of that trip. He is not back yet. And so bringing our message this morning will be Reverend David uh, Berg, our minister to preschool and children. So let's prepare our hearts now as we hear the prelude for our time of worship together. The scripture that will call us to worship today is Psalms 9, verses 1 through 2. I will thank you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of the marvelous things you have done. I will be filled with joy because of you. I will sing praises in your name, O Most High. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be here today. Please be with us in your house of worship. Please open our ears to help us receive the message that is delivered today. In your name we pray. Amen. Charges number six hundred and one. Six hundred and one. 
Well, church, it is a good day when there is water in the baptistry, is it not? Uh, many of you already know Wet, Rhett Petroka. Uh, Rhett has been nurtured by his family, his parents, Beth and Mike, alongside his siblings, Gunner and Wyatt and Delaney, and he has been nurtured by this church. Uh, several of you have served as leaders and uh, teachers, and you have loved and cared for him, said, uh, when when we are able to be back together in person again, Rhett is ready to be baptized. So a couple weeks ago, Rhett and I sat down together and we had a conversation and he explained in, in his words and in his understanding uh, what, he, what it means to be a follower of Christ and how he wanted to live his entire life uh, on behalf of, of God and how Jesus has died for him and his, he understands that and he wants to be baptized. And so uh, I, was, I was driving in this morning and there was a lyric to a song that I heard, and it said, uh, there's, there's a sun coming up in my soul, Lord, in my soul. And I immediately thought of Rhett. Uh, if you're ever around Rhett for any length of time, he is sunshine. He, he will, he will, he's upbeat. He has a, a pep in his step, and he brings joy that I believe is a gift from God. So, Rhett, what is your confession of faith? Jesus is Lord. Amen. Rhett Petroka. My brother in Christ, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Here I am to bow down, 
here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. Sing, here I am to worship. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy. I'll never know. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. I'll never it cost to see my sin oh, sing that again I'll never know I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Amen. Please be seated. You know what? I'm just going to speak from here instead of going over there. Uh, it's my turn this morning uh, to get to share with you just a little bit about a word about giving. Uh, and my word for you, it's actually two words today, are thank you. That is my overarching words is thank you uh, for your giving, for your giving to this church and for your giving to the ministries of this church. And the area I'd like to highlight today of all days, and it's a little bit ironic, is the AV and technology area. Uh, I promise this was not planned. Uh, in fact, what I said in the first service is this. Uh, your giving to our budget has allowed for over the last year of pandemic and even as we regather to help us keep up with the ever, ever, ever growing needs in, AV, in the avian technology world. And as you've noticed, we're having a little bit of difficulty today, so thank you for your patience. There's another thank you. Uh, but I wanted to highlight that your giving has allowed us to, uh, uh, to continue to gather together for the last year and a few months in one place. And when I say that, I mean all of us who are gathered here and have been for the last several weeks, as well as all of us who are gathered in front of our screens right now, we have all been able to worship in one space and that's something worth praising. That is something worth being happy about and something worth thanking you for your giving to make it happen. Now, as we continue in this new world, uh, as you can see, the needs continue as well. And so your continued giving is much appreciated. Uh, another about AV and technology, I would be remiss right now if I did not thank those volunteers that are working in our AV booth, even as we speak. They have been tireless. They have worked two services ever since we came back to in-person services. They uh, swing at curveball after curveball that we throw every week uh, when things need to be new and things need to change. And here's the bottom line. The bottom line is we continue to improve and we continue to do better and better every week at being able to worship effectively together no matter where we are. So thank you for those gifts and I pray that those uh, will continue. Please pray with me. 
God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for Rhett, and we celebrate his baptism today. During this time in our service, we ask that you bless our tithes and offerings so that they may be used to show your love to those all around us. Please be with us this week and give us opportunities to share your love. In your name we pray. Hear the new voices down jaded streets, for he is all we're meant to be, learning who he is in the wilderness of convenient lies and cheap success. Each time he turns away from lesser things, he is all we're meant to be. Growing wise, he understands that all our castles here are built on sand. And so he builds his own within. So when the kingdom comes, it comes in him. Observe the crowd ready to condemn. He forgives the girl, they turn on him. But he stands by her till each stone's released. Cause he is all we're meant to be. And growing wise, he understands the kind of sacrifice that love demands. And so he pays the price for sin. So when the kingdom comes, it comes in him, in him. Looks down 
on how we failed his wrath may burn but grace prevails this jesus christ is all god's heart can see for he is all we're meant to be for he is all to be. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Pat. Please join me in just a moment of prayer. Dear God, we come to you this morning with praise on our lips and thanks in our hearts because it's been a good day so far. We thank you for, for Rhett and for being a part of this special moment for him and his family. And we give you praise for the work of your spirit in his life that we have played a part of as his family of faith. We give you thanks for our, our friends who are in South Dakota and have been doing good work for you there, for the relationships they have built with the people there and the ministry they have had over all these years. And as they were come home, we pray for safe travel. We thank you for a summer that feels like things are starting to get back to the way they used to be. And we thank you for a season that to remind us just how important this is. And God, we, we know that there are some of us who are going through difficult times in their lives and who are struggling with sorrow and sadness, loss of loved ones and friends, and we just ask your presence with them, your comfort and your peace in their lives. And now, God, we ask that you be with us in these next few minutes as we turn to study your word, speak to our hearts, and ask that you speak through me to deliver a word this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's not every day I get to stand up in this pulpit. It's a little intimidating, I'll be honest. There are some huge shoes to fill standing here. But I'm excited, and I hope you all will bear with me for the next little bit. Our scripture passage today comes from Luke chapter 2. We'll start in verse uh, yeah, 39. It's in your bulletin. You can follow along there, or you can turn to your own Bibles if you have them with you. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Every year, his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover, when he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he was saying to them. 
Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. About two years ago, I made a pretty big choice when it comes to our preschool and children's Sunday school materials. Up to that point, I'd been observing, and it's not that the curriculum was bad, it's just I didn't feel like the kids were connecting to it as well as I wanted them to. It seemed they were a little disengaged at the time. Now, making a decision like this isn't something you do in a vacuum, so I engaged some of my Bible study leaders at the time and asked for their opinion and was a little surprised and maybe a little vindicated to find that they felt the same way. So I started asking around, reaching out to friends and peers in ministry, folks I know and trust are doing good work in other churches, finding out what materials they used and if they would recommend them for us. I had read through a lot of good material over the next several weeks, but the one that I kept coming back to and getting the most recommendations for is a curriculum called Orange. Now, I'm a Tennessee fan, so I'm predisposed to like anything orange, but I wanted to do my due diligence. I wanted to make sure this was really the right fit for us. Because Orange is a weird name for a Bible study curriculum. It doesn't sound like something you would want to study on a Sunday morning. As I researched and as I read through their materials and the resources, I found a picture that they used in some of their earlier years. It was a a church in yellow on one side and a house in red on the other. And towards the middle, the color started to blend. So what happens when you blend those two colors? You get orange. The caption under the picture read, where the light of Christ meets the heart of the home. And that's their mission. That's the model they follow. How to leverage those two great institutions of church and family to work together to pull their resources, to pull in the same direction for the spiritual growth and edification of our children and our youth. Their material spans from birth through high school, and I wanted to know what the curriculum actually taught, where their focus was there. So I looked at the materials, and I found their preschool materials called First Look. And that's what it's supposed to do, give children from birth to four years old a first look at some of the important truths of faith, to teach them that God loves them, that God made them, that Jesus wants to be their friend forever, that the Bible is true and can be trusted, and that the church is here to love them and care for them, to nurture them and support them in their lives. When they move into grade school, the curriculum becomes 252 kids, the theme verse being one we just read, Luke 252. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and the people. They see that as the perfect model for how we should want our children to grow. We should want our children to grow wise, making good choices. We should want our children to grow strong, not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, spiritually. We should want our children to grow with good relationships, not just with God, but with their friends, their family, their loved ones, and the people around them. I was hooked. I loved what I was seeing. I presented it to our Bible study leaders, and they seemed to be on board. We did a test summer with it, and everybody seemed to really enjoy it. The kids were engaged, and so we made the switch. We've used it ever since. But that 252 idea stuck with me. It resonated with me. Because as good a model as that is for children, let's be honest, it applies to us as adults as well. Because... No matter how old you get, you should always want to try and become more mature in your relationship with God. You should always want to be more wise. You should always want to grow in those relationships with God and the people around you. So I've been percolating on this idea for about two years now, and we're getting to reap the benefits of those thoughts today. But let's unpack Luke 2 for just a second. Give us a little bit of context before we move forward. Because I think Luke provides two accounts of Jesus and his family when he was still a child for a very important reason. 
You see, this is one of only two places where we see anything about Jesus before his ministry begins. Matthew provides another account. We get the familiar birth narrative, followed by the arrival of the wise men, and then the family's imminent flight to Egypt, one step ahead of an angry pharaoh, not pharaoh, Herod. There we go. Luke, however, goes a different route with his depiction of the early years. He gives us the birth narrative, but then he, sk he leaves out the Egypt part. At eight days old, the family goes to Jerusalem for Jesus' circumcision of the firstborn. I think it's interesting that they came to redeem the Redeemer, and they were too poor to be able to offer a lamb, so they brought two pigeons, and yet they were carrying in their arms the Lamb of God. That's just free knowledge there. But those, that's an important occasion. Because shortly after that, Simeon comes and approaches the family. And a light to the Gentiles, glory to your people Israel. And then Anna comes over, the widow woman who'd been coming to the temple for years and years waiting to see the Messiah. And she comes to see the baby and then goes on to tell everyone that she has seen God's salvation. Mary and Joseph ponder these things. They're confused and a little amazed by what they're seeing. But the Bible tells us they take Jesus home to Nazareth. And they do the best they can to raise him well. In wisdom, in favor with God and the people. And then 12 years later, we're back in Jerusalem again. It's, it's Passover time, and every year they've come. And on the way home, as is custom, they're traveling along in their caravan with all their friends and neighbors... The children and the women are at the front, setting the pace, and the men are in the back, and I'm sure that's not a surprise to anybody. But Jesus was 12 years old at the time, and in that tradition, he was in that in-between stage. He wasn't quite an adult yet, but he wasn't really a child back and forth. So it's not surprising that at the end of that first day of travel, the parents get together and have that conversation I'm sure none of you parents have ever had of, well, I thought he was with you. No, I thought he was with you. And that horrifying realization that he wasn't there. So going back to the Jerusalem and spending several days searching for their child, they find him in the temple where he's having conversation with the religious leaders, the elites of the day, and apparently holding his own. And they were amazed at his wisdom. Jesus has a great conversation with his parents as they come up and again I'm sure none of you parents have had that conversation of what were you thinking what if you'd been dead in a ditch by the road you had us so worried and they took him back to Jerusalem uh, back from Jerusalem to Nazareth and again Luke tells us he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and the people it's that same model so let's unpack that just a bit I'm sure you probably all have a store of wise sayings that you use in your lives from time to time. One of my favorites, and so many of you have probably heard me say it, is one my dad used all the time. It goes like this. I'm just doing the best I can with what I have for Jesus' sake today. It's a great phrase because you can use it anywhere. Are you having a good day? Oh, I'm just doing the best I can with what I have for Jesus' sake today. But then on those hard days where things aren't going well or you're not feeling good and life's just bad, I'm just doing the best I can with what I have for Jesus' sake today. You see, it fits. You can use it anywhere, and y'all have my permission. Feel free to borrow it. Every culture has collections of wise sayings like this. In the Bible, we have the book of Proverbs that's used as a model of instruction for children on how to be wise adults and how to live a good life. In American culture, we can point to the collection of sayings by Ben Franklin. Here are just a couple of his. Dost thou love life? Then do not squander time, for that is the stuff life is made of. Or how about this one? He that sows thorns should not go barefoot. Last one. A quarrelsome man has no good neighbors. Those are pretty wise sayings, but according to biblical tradition, wisdom is more than just pithy little sayings that we can toss around when we don't have anything better to say. Wisdom 
is ju not just practical, it's religious, it's spiritual. And it all begins with a healthy dose of fear. And not fear like I'm terrified or afraid or living in dread, but fear as in respect or reverence for God, for a, someone who is vastly superior to us in every possible way. And this respect, this reverence, is born out of love, out of hope, because contrary to what the world would have us believe, our God isn't some being that set things in motion and then walked away, unconcerned with what happens. No, our God seeks us out. He wants relationship with each and every one of us, restoring us to good fellowship and to communion with him over and over again. How can we not respect that? Time after time, chance after chance, God forgives us when we sin. He extends mercy to us, even going as far as to send his only son to die on the cross, taking our blame as the atoning sacrifice. Again, how? How can we not have respect or reverence for a God who's willing to go that far for us? Biblical wisdom challenges us to take a long, hard look at our lives, to examine our priorities and see if they reflect that kind of respect and reverence for God. How are we allocating our time, our resources? Is our speech, our language indicative of godly values? Are we willing to submit to serving God, even if that service might stretch us outside of our comfort zone a little? Do we extend the same grace to others that we have so richly received from God? This is what biblical wisdom is all about. It's living our lives in a way that reflects the ethical and moral values of God. It's more than just making good choices, recognizing right from wrong, or discerning between truth and lies. Biblical wisdom is loving your neighbor as yourself. It's loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you. Biblical wisdom tells you if someone forces you to go one mile, go with them a second also. According to the world, this kind of wisdom is foolishness. It's self-sacrificing. It's humbling. It takes us out of the spotlight so that we can shine that light on those we other might, otherwise might choose to ignore. Biblical wisdom leads to the cross, and the world just can't make sense of that. But you know what? I'll take the foolishness of the cross over the wisdom of the world, 24 hours a, a, a day, seven, seven days a week, 365 days a year. But here's the thing, when we choose to orient, orient our lives around this kind of godly biblical wisdom, we also are going to grow in our maturity as well. Biblical wisdom trains us to think less about ourselves and more about others. And isn't that the hallmark of maturity? Spiritual maturity is when we start to realize that it's not about what I want, but what can I do for others? It's not about getting what I want, but what can I give to make sure that others get what they need? Spiritual maturity grows as we become more and more Christ-like. The Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4 that we should strive to be more united in Christ uh, are more united in our faith and knowledge of Christ so that we can be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. He goes on to illustrate immaturity as being tossed about and blown around on the wind by every new wave of teaching, while maturity, on the other hand, means not being influenced when people come around and try to trick us with lies that are so clever they sound like the truth. In verse 15, he says, Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. To me, it sounds like godly wisdom and spiritual maturity are woven so tightly together that if you pursue one, you can't help but grow in the other. Now, biblical wisdom is bound with spiritual maturity, like we just said, so let's think about how those two characteristics impact our relationship with God and with those around us. I'll never forget walking into 
cross worship at Cross Point Kids Camp. That's a blast from the past some of y'all might remember. This was over on the campus of Carson Newman. I was probably in third or fourth grade, and the song blasting over the speakers was Shine by the Newsboys. And I've seen all the camp counselors up on stage dancing in the, or dancing in the aisles, beach balls flying through the air, and pool noodles, all those crazy things that you see at a kid's camp. And man, it was just the coolest thing. I couldn't tell you anything more about that song, Shine, but I do remember the lyrics of the chorus. They've stuck with me for 27 years. It goes like this. Shine, make them wonder what you got. Make them wish that they were not on the outside looking bored. Shine, let it shine before all men. Let them see good works and then let them glorify the Lord. Every time I hear or read Matthew 5, 16, that song comes to my head and I can't help but start singing and humming that song, tapping my toe. I was just doing it from up here, couldn't see it, but that's the thing, biblical wisdom and maturity move us towards lives that reflect the light of Christ. They challenge us to seek justice, to do mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. They remind us of our own limitations in light of God's own unlimited provision. As we grow in biblical wisdom and spiritual maturity, we begin to get an intimate feeling for the heart of God. In our lives, we are able to sense the movement of the Holy Spirit guiding us and leading us. It helps us become sensitive to the needs of others around us. It helps us to be forgiving and compassionate. It gives us courage to stand up to injustice and stand with the, the oppressed. It turns us into lights in the darkness that shine for others to see, pointing them to the hope, the joy, and the peace that we have in Christ. Now, Real quick, let's go back to Luke 2.52 together for just a second. And Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and the people. None of these things happen in a vacuum. I think Luke includes these two accounts from earlier in the passage for a reason. Mary and Joseph made it a point, to emphasize, made it a point of emphasis in their lives to model their faith for their children. They made sacrifices to make sure that their family lived out God's precepts. In ancient tr Jewish tradition, there were three ma major pilgrimage festivals that families were to observe every year. Passover, Pentecost, and the Festival of Booths. Going to Jerusalem for any of these festivals wasn't cheap. You had to worry about who was going to take care of your livestock while you were gone or take care of your crops. It would have cost you a week's worth of work and income. On top of that, you also had to worry about where we're going to stay and getting food for your family and purchasing whatever animals you needed to offer as sacrifice. Most families couldn't afford to go to all three festivals every year, so they only chose one, typically being Passover, as it was seen as the most important of the three. Mary and Joseph would have fit into this crowd, and Luke makes it a point to tell us they never missed a year. They knew how important it was to impress upon their children the importance of observing religious practices and traditions, of spending time with the family of faith and worship and community. In fact, that's one of the things that God commanded the Israelites way back in the book of Deuteronomy. Impress these things upon your children. Teach them why we do the things we do and why they're important. God instructs them to make their faith and the discipleship of their children an everyday part of their lives. And that applies to us too, because if we want our children to grow in biblical wisdom or spiritual maturity, then we have to model that for, our, for them ourselves. And we can't slack off on that. Like I said earlier, it's important that we examine our priorities from time to time so that we are aware of what we are teaching our children to value in their lives. No one ever said that growing up is easy. No matter how old you may be, there's always room to keep growing. So I'm gonna ask you all a question this morning. One you've all heard a million times, probably asked a million times. What do you wanna be when you grow up? 
I hope that by now through this sermon you've kind of got a sense of what my answer to that question might be. And I'm going to say this, I'm holding all of you, or I'm asking all of you to hold me accountable to that, to walk with me through that, to help me grow in wisdom and maturity and in favor with God and all of you. And in return, I offer the same. I'll walk with you through that journey. As we all strive to grow in wisdom and maturity and in our relationships with God and each other, it's my prayer that we'll find strength in our unity as a family of faith. If you don't have a family of faith, guess what? We'd love to talk with you about how you can join us. Or maybe you're feeling that the Lord's calling you to join the larger family of faith and walk through these waters just like Rhett did earlier. If so, we'd love to talk to you about that as well. Whatever God's call on your heart may be this morning, we're about to come to a time of response. And I encourage you to use the, this time to respond to whatever God is calling you to. As we stand and we sing our closing hymn, listen for God's call in your life. Amen. Bless our homes and families. Let us stand and sing. If y'all will just remain standing for just a second, I'm going to invite Beth and Mike and Rhett and any of the rest of the family that want to come down and stand with us for just a second. We are so excited for the Petroka family this morning. It's just been a special day for them, and we want to take a moment to celebrate. I'm going to ask them afterwards to, if they want to stand out in the Welcome Center, so any of you who want to come by and say congratulations to Rhett and to the rest of the family, that you can have that moment. And we also have a special certificate of baptism here that I'm going to present 
to them. And Pam? Bless you as you go into a world that needs you. And may you be blessed by being a blessing. I know you will. Amen. Thank you.